Amen. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Exodus and chapter number 30 as we continue and uh, through the book of Exodus on Sunday mornings, Exodus and chapter number 30. And if you stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word to honor the Word of God, Exodus and chapter number 30, beginning in verse number 1, we'll read down to verse uh, number 10, and I'll read aloud as you follow along there, Exodus and chapter number 30, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make a, upon it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the corners thereof, and upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be for places for the staves to bear, with it, bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat. That is over the testimony where I will meet, I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning. When he dressed the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at the evening, he shall burn incense upon it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. And ye shall offer no strange incense, nor burn a burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it, once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement, once in a year shall he make an atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, that you might uh, open our eyes to the blessings that we have. That you might show us the truth of our relationship or the possibility of that relationship that you might meet with us. And Lord, might we have a heart that's ready to hear, that we might have a, a heart that's ready to change. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. As we've been making our way through the tabernacle, through the view that is presented by Exodus, it is began back at the mercy seat. And came out through and showed the table of showbread and, and then made its way to the coverings and the separation that existed and, and then eventually went to the brazen altar by means of overcoming the separation. Overcoming the separation that is brought by the veil will be that which is offered at the brazen altar. It is the brazen altar because it represents the judgment of God that will be placed upon the sacrifice as an atonement uh, a covering, but ultimately as a final sacrifice would be given in the person of Jesus Christ, not simply an atonement, but a propitiation. Propitiation, a satisfaction of the anger of God, not just a rolling over of the anger of God like atonement. And the brazen altar represents all that is available by the sacrifice of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that, uh, that he offered himself as a sacrifice for sin of all the world and the sin of all mankind was taken by God the Father there. And you can read about it in Psalm 18 as, as darkness covered them about. And he comes and he places the sin of all mankind upon the person of Jesus Christ. The by Isaiah 53 tells us that uh, he was bruised for us and by his stripes are we healed. He is a man that is acquainted with grief. That is the brazen altar. But there is a connection between the brazen altar and the golden altar of incense. And in order for us to get to the golden altar of incense, we must first come by way of the brazen altar. You cannot have access to the golden altar without coming first to the brazen altar. You say, preacher, could you translate into New Testament? Uh, certainly. You cannot come into the presence of God via prayer 
without first coming to the place of a recognition that your dependency for your sin must be placed upon God and forgiveness must be granted, reconciliation must be granted, and therefore because of the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross of Calvary, the wrath of God poured out upon him, when I accept that propitiation for my sins, then I now have access to the person of Jesus Christ to the very presence of God. We're not going to take as much time looking at the article. It's given a little bit different order than some of the other articles. If you, if you remember that some of the other articles, the, the material is given first. It is made of shittim wood. It's overlaid with brass or it's overlaid with gold or, 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 or the position is given. There's a crown upon it. And all these things are also evident here and the altar of incense. It also represents the humanity of man, perfect sinless humanity, but overlaid with gold, the deity of God, uh, the deity of Christ, and it has the crown around the top representing his authority and his kingship in our life. It still represents the person of Jesus Christ, the article does. But it's given a little bit different order. Instead of giving the materials first, it gives the use first. And I think it's so amazing to me as the Lord has been working on my heart, you know, uh, a lot of times in, and when we talk about uh, spiritual things, we, we often spend a lot of time talking about the material, the, the, the activity, okay, I got, I got to go to church, I got to read my Bible, I, I got to witness to somebody, and I got to not do this and not do that. We talk about the, the makeup, and that's important, it's there. But before the makeup of this altar is given, the use is given. The purpose is given first. And often in our life, we put implementation ahead of purpose. And the purpose is given in verse number one. If you look there, it says, And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense thereupon. The purpose of this altar is to burn incense upon it. We say, well, what, what, is that, uh, what does that mean? Well, I'm so glad that sometimes when we go through a little bit of typology in the Bible or we look at different things that we, we would have to say something like, you know, I, I think this means this or, or it looks like this means this. But can I tell you, when it comes to the altar of incense, there's little doubt because the Bible tells us exactly what it is. So let's just define it first before we get into the, the purpose. If you take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 141, and we'll just look at two passages and though there are there are several, Psalm 141 in verse number two. The Bible tells us about, uh, gives us a picture into what is being talked about here with the altar of incense. Psalm 141 in verse number two. Let's start in verse number one. I, I, Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and fill the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You remember when Aaron would come in and would light the incense in the morning and also the evening. Turn to another one, Revelation in chapter number five. Revelation in chapter number five, it will give us a definition of this incense, of the incense altar. Revelation in chapter number five and uh, verse number eight, and let's, let's start in verse number seven. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down from before the lamb, having every one of them hearts and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. The altar of incense represents the prayers of the saints represents the prayers of those that have been to the brazen altar and now they come to the golden altar. The placement of the altar, if you remember in our reading, is in the holy place right in front of the mercy seat. Now, if you were to look at it from the Old Testament view, the priest would go in and, and he would see the, the table of showbread. He would see the candlestick, the menorah, and there he would see the altar of incense and then there would be the veil and on the other side of the veil would be the mercy seat. Well, friend, the veil is not there anymore. The veil has been rent in twain. The Bible told us in, in Hebrews chapter number nine that the veil, uh, we have access through the veil which is his flesh. 
So that when he was broken for us, when he was bruised for us, when he was crucified for us and, and the propitiation had taken place and, and he takes the blood, his own blood, not the blood of bullocks or rams or lambs, but his own blood into the most holy place in heaven and sprinkles the blood upon the mercy seat that there now is access for those that have been to the brazen altar to come to the golden altar and light incense before the mercy seat. Now what that means for us is those of us that have Receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, have access to come before the mercy seat and offer prayers to the Lord. You say, preacher, I've heard a bunch of messages on prayer. Me too. <laughs> Me too. I've read books on prayer. Me too. Me too. But can I ask you a question? Then why is prayer so weak? Why is prayer defined as the weakest area of our Christian life? I believe this will give us a look at prayer in a different way. From the altar of incense that will help us understand it is not the access that we struggle with, it is the attitude towards prayer. The need for prayer the role of prayer and what prayer does in our life as when we go before God, it is by means of prayer that we get help and grace in time of need. And to be honest, we, dict we, we demonstrate to God that we are dependent on other things when prayer is not the priority. We demonstrate to God that we have developed other ways of dealing with issues and problems when prayer is not the priority. What does it tell us about this? Well, let's look at a few things about the person of Jesus Christ. I, I know we talked about his, his um, priestly ministry when we talked about the veil, but, but can I tell you, prayer is less about our activity and more about our activity that we have with Christ. Prayer is a two-person conversation. We often view prayer as a one-person conversation. I have to go and pray. I have to spend time in prayer. And it's so much about a means and so much less a conversation. Okay, imagine if we had that same attitude uh, when it came to our communication with our spouse. Well, what are you gonna do? I have to go and talk. Right, that's what she wants to do, she wants to talk. Right? And you describe it to your friend. And when I get home tonight, I gotta talk. <laughs> really? Why? That's what she wants. When you describe it that way, it certainly sounds like a chore. Uh, wait, let me, when we describe it that way, it certainly sounds like a chore. Right? But that, that wasn't how it was when when love was new, right? I remember when I was in college and all my, all my buddies would be going and playing basketball in the gym, which, which I used to do before her. And I would stand on the gym floor and be like, ah, oh, man, don't go over there and talk to her. Come play with us. And I'd watch them as they would have this giddiness about them. No, 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 I get to go talk. We're going to go spend some time together talking. It's awesome. And the rest of us were going, oh, this is sick. <laughs> Come on, man. And then one day it happened. One day, by the very mercy of God, God allowed me to be introduced to my wife, or who wasn't my wife yet at the point. Uh, and, and, and then all of a sudden, I'm over there, and everybody else is on the gym floor. Guys, I'm going to talk. And they're going, come on, man, that's sick. Don't care. I get to talk to her. And she talks back to me. This is exciting. But over the process of time, when the relationship becomes of less priority, we leave work and tell our buddy, friend at work, yeah, I know. When I get home, my wife says, we need to talk. It's not so much the implementation or, 
or the activity, it's the attitude towards it. And we used to run to that conversation. And it's amazing when you, you, you read the Bible how often God uses the idea of haste. The haste, the quickness to pray. The quickness to run before the Lord. So let's talk about the benefit of it for just a minute. If you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans in chapter number 5. The altar of incense the, is the means by which I take advantage of of the ministry of the person of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter number five, look what it says, beginning in verse number nine there, Romans chapter five, verse number nine. It says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Praise the Lord that I'm saved from wrath because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's salvation, that's the brazen altar. Then it says this, verse number 10. For if we then were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Hey, friend, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Salvation was given to me at the brazen altar. But now that I've been reconciled, now that I've been brought back in relationship with God, now I'm not saved in my daily life by his death. I'm saved in my daily life by his life, by his ministry, by his activity. Well, what is that activity? Take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans and chapter number eight. We know that he, he is there as our intercessor, but, but Paul presents it in such a way in Romans chapter number eight. Look at it beginning in verse number 32. Romans chapter number eight, beginning in verse number 32, the Bible says this. And he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that judges. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also, also maketh intercession for us. Can I tell you, it doesn't say he made intercession for us. He maketh intercession for us. Goes back to verse number 33. So who shall lay charge at God's elect? Who is going to accuse or who is going to uh, uh, um, uh, question the status of God's people? Who is going to question the, the position of God's people when Christ at the right hand of the Father, as our intercessor, as our mediator, will not only stand there as a ministry to give us all things, but also to deflect all things that would uh, uh, question our position in him. And we access his ministry through prayer. We access his ministry through prayer. He standeth at the right hand of the Father, desirous not only to overcome any charge that is given, but also give us all things. Can I tell you, him giving is a response to us asking. So prayer is not a, 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 a activity that is, that is ritualistic in the sense of something I do for my, myself or for my purposes, it is my very means to take advantage, better word, it is my very means to enjoy the fellowship with the person of Jesus Christ. And I come to the altar of incense, but I'm gonna tell you, so often prayer is, is demonstrated by chore. Dare, prayer is demonstrated by prayer is demonstrated by an inability for us to understand the the pleasure of it, the joy of it, or the haste of it, because we only view our part of it. And we come to prayer. Okay, got to pray. We even, you know, invoke willpower. I'm going to pray. It's so much more than that. And I think because there is a lack of haste, a running to it, it, it 
demonstrates our inability to depend upon the person of God. And so often our life is not dictated by our prayer. Our prayer is dictated by our life. Let me give you an illustration. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers in chapter number 16. If you remember, uh, in the book of Numbers, there was a rebellion that went on. It was a rebellion by the sons of Korah. Now, without going into a long uh, background, can I tell you just briefly about the sons of Korah? They are descendants of Aaron, uh, Aaron's son, and the sons of Korah and the transportation uh, of the tabernacle that we're talking about, the sons of Korah would carry the most precious things, uh, the items, because they would take down the tabernacle and they would take it to the next place. Well, well the, the coverings and, and even, even the brazen altar and, and different uh, items could be uh, packed up and actually put on carts or put on wagons, so to speak. And the families that were given responsibilities for those items, uh, the coverings and, 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 and uh, the, the, the curtains and the poles, they were put on carts and they were rolled to the next place. But the items of gold, the utensils of the tabernacle, they were put in bags and they were to be carried over the shoulder and carried by person, not in a cart. They were deemed too precious to put into a cart. Think of the Ark of the Covenant and how God wanted the Ark of the Covenant to be carried and what happened when David put it on a cart and Uzzah touched it and God killed him. The Ark is too precious to be put on a cart. It should be borne by men. And we can think of it two ways. We can think of it this way. Oh, the burden of carrying the most precious things of God. I'm going to tell you, some of us, some of us view carrying the precious things of God as a burden. When in reality, what a privilege. It was because they were chosen above the other families that Korah was given the responsibility to carry by hand those precious things. Well, the problem was Korah started to think more highly of himself than he thought ought to. And he started to question the authority of Moses, ultimately he started to question the authority of God. And this rebellion takes place, and God will divide them, and then he will open up the ground and <laughs> swallow up Korah and his family, and those followers of Korah. And here's where we find ourselves in Exodus chapter number 16, starting in verse number 31. We're going to read a little ways down. And it came to pass that as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened uh, numbers, I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 16, opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men uh, that uh, appertaineth unto Korah and all their goods. And they and all that uh, pertaineth unto, unto them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled and cr at the cry of them for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Eleazar, the son of Aaron, and the priest, that he take up the censer out of the burning, and scatter thou the fire yonder, for they are hollowed. And the censer of these sinners against, and censer these, of these sinners against their own souls, and let them make their broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the Lord, therefore they are hallowed, and they shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar took the, uh, the priest, took the brazen censer, wherewith they had, were burnt and had offered, and they were made a broad plates for a covering of the altar. To be a memorial unto the children of Israel, that no stranger that is not of the seed of Aaron come near unto the altar, offer incense before the Lord. That he be not as Korah and his company, as the Lord said unto him by the hand of Moses. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass when the congregation was gathered against Moses and Aaron that they looked towards the tabernacle of the congregation. And behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came from before the tabernacle of the congregation. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. 
and they fell upon their faces. And Moses and Aaron took a censer and put fire thereon from the altar and put on incense. And go quickly unto the congregation and make atonement for them, for there is wrath gone out from before the Lord. The plague has begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Can I tell you what is happening in this position? There is a uh, un misunderstanding of authority and who ultimately is the one that has the right to determine what happens in their life. And they were looking to Korah and Korah took authority upon himself and God said, I'm sorry, authority is mine. And I will give authority to whom I give authority to. And they rose up and they began to murmur against Moses and Aaron and say, you've killed the people of God. And God's wrath was turned upon them. And so what was God's means of deliverance? He told Moses and Aaron to get the fire and put on incense and quickly go amongst the congregation. Can I tell you, Moses and Aaron took this seriously. They put the fire on the incense, or the fire on the censer and they put the incense on and they ran amongst the congregation and the plague was stayed. Because it was the incense that was offered unto the Lord that stayed the plague. Man, there is an urgency about this incense that's being offered. Because it is a, they violated the authority of God. Now, can I ask you a question? How, how do we violate the authority of God? You know what it's called? Sin. Sin. Can I tell you, we as Christians have developed a very casual attitude towards sin. There is an entire church culture that says we should have a casual attitude towards sin. You know what God says? Quickly. Run. Run where? To the altar of incense. So that you may offer up your prayer to the Lord of repentance and cleansing and praise the Lord, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Amen. But can I tell you how we go to confess sin? Hey, it's not my fault. That's just the way I am. That's right. It's not my fault. It's just, it's just, you know, it was a mistake. There's no urgency about our prayer. There's no urgency about abating the wrath of God. You say, preacher, this is the New Testament. Grace has been extended. Yeah, you read the book of Hebrews, chapter number 12. Guess what God does to his children? He chastens them. He chastens them. I know just the other day we had an incident at the house. And the children were going to, some of the children were going to need discipline. So I sent them to the room. I walk in and I'm going to take care of this discipline. I'm going to apply the board of, uh, board of Education to the Seat of Knowledge in a loving way. Can I tell you, when I, as soon as I walk in, especially the little ones, you know what they do? They know why I'm coming. There's no question why I'm coming. You know what they do? Daddy, I love you. Can I hug you? Sure. Sure. But can I tell you, though sometimes discipline is still necessary, my attitude towards the discipline is different when they go, Daddy, I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I hug you? As opposed to ugh, defiance. And can I tell you, we find ourselves when we do not run to confession, when we do not run to pray, God sees it as a question of his authority in our life. And the discipline is different. What we're saying is, we don't depend upon God. We don't need God. Your dependency upon God will be depicted by your prayer, not by your activity. But not only do we need to run to God for forgiveness, not only do we need to run to God for cleansing, 
Can I tell you, we also need to run to God for help. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Philippians. Philippians. This is probably my favorite passage. Philippians. And to be honest, I've read this and actually talked about this, and I've used this illustration before. But the idea of haste being attached to it, the idea of running to pray. The Bible says this in the book of Philippians. Verse number four, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Uh, let me just try to illustrate this for you. Caden, come up here, buddy. Adam, come up here. And uh, grab a couple hymn books on your way up here. Oh, we need somebody big and ugly. Um, Third John, are you in here? Oh, come up here, yeah. Now, just understand this. The Bible says, be careful for nothing, right? Be anxious for nothing. But by what? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, okay? You can look at it later, but the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13, that one of the sacrifices that we offer is the sacrifice of praise, okay? Guess where that's offered? Not only in the singing, but also in the praying. When's the last time you praise God in your prayer? Okay, so by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let a request be made known to God and your heart and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, the word keep is a military term. It is a defense term. These are the burdens of life. You got any burdens? You're like, give me some more books, brother. These are the burdens of life, right? We carry these burdens. We have these burdens. They're ours to carry. And we face life, and we have the mean old devil <laughs> to face. Not only do we have the devil, he can also be the flesh. He's split you in half, okay? Now, can I tell you, life is, it is difficult to stand against the wilds of the devil holding on to the burdens of life. Who doesn't have burdens, okay? If you're waiting to serve God until you're burdenless, okay, you're never gonna serve him. If you're waiting to be successful in the Christian life until God, when God takes care of all your burdens, you'll never, you'll never get there. We have these burdens, but the Bible tells us about these burdens to be careful for nothing, to be anxious for nothing. How do we get rid of these burdens? By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Now, either we do not think our burdens are strong or great enough, or we do not recognize the, the danger that is in the devil or the danger that is in our own flesh because the only way to release and get the peace of God that passes understanding is by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So why don't we, why don't we run to pray? Why don't we haste to pray? Well, preacher, I tried it, and it just doesn't work. Well, maybe your prayer's a one-way conversation. Mm. Maybe you haven't been to the brazen altar yet. Mm. And so here, he wants to pray. And the Lord Jesus Christ does more than just take your burdens. Take his burdens. He does more than just take his burdens. The Bible says, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ, which means that when I pray, I am expressing dependency upon God, not only to find forgiveness and cleansing, but I am putting myself under his authority Amen. and behind him to where my heart is kept, not through my own power, because guess what the Bible says about my heart? It's desperately wicked. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And guess what the Bible says about my mind? It needs to be renewed. I cannot do it on my own. Amen. 
And so I, I need the person of Christ. And so now, when I face these burdens, these burdens are nothing to him, when I face these burdens or I face these difficulties, I do not have to face it on my own. I face it under the authority and the power of Jesus Christ. And guess what he is to Jesus Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Guess what my flesh is? Under the control of the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how do I get in the spirit? By prayer. By request. You're not going to grab the spirit and fill yourself with it. You're going to, by prayer, empty yourself of that which is sinful and by confession saying, God, I'm guilty. Amen. Help me. And as you empty yourself, guess what he does? Fills you with the Spirit. Amen. And you're in this position. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that passage is directly connected that if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another and sure, truly our fellowship is, is with the person of Jesus Christ. So when I pray, when I haste to pray and confess the sin that exists in my life, when I run to pray, guess where I'm putting myself in position? Under the authority and protection and success that is given to me by the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This is available to every believer. It is available, as, 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 as much available as Aaron lit the incense in the morning and in the evening. And it was a holy thing before God. That's what the Bible says. And God said, I will meet you there. I'll meet you there. Amen. Oh, preacher, I'm too weak. That's okay, he can forgive. I'm too sinful. It's okay, he can forgive. And when he meets you, let me just tell you what we do. Oh, man, we pray. Okay, Lord, okay, okay, okay. Now what I do? My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. All I have to do is get out in front and lead. All I have to do is follow. Well, preacher, I prayed. What do I do next? Well, the Bible says Aaron lit this incense. It was going to be a perpetual thing. You know what that sounds like? Forever. Pray without ceasing. Right. I prayed and, it, and it, it just didn't finish. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not the occasional one-time prayer. You know what the Bible says in the book of Luke in chapter number 17? That the lady would go before the king and it, because of her perpetual crying, because of her importunity, Amen. the king finally answered. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. The problem is not the ineffectiveness of prayer. It's a lack of understanding of God's authority. Amen. And God's authority is demonstrated in our life, not by our activity, but by our prayer. But can I tell you, your prayer will ultimately determine your activity. Amen. I'm not saying, well, as long as you can pray, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> no, no. Because prayer will bring you closer in relationship with God and your heart will line up with his heart. And then he will give you the desires of his heart. Thank you, Jesus. How do I solve this problem? Hey, preacher, you don't tell me just to pray. Okay, I'm going to tell you to pray. Amen. <laughs> I, I've tried that. Okay, pray some more. That's right. It may be that the problem that needs to be solved cannot be solved until the problem that is you is fixed. Amen. And how is that going to be fixed? In prayer. There is not a haste to pray. There is not a running to pray. I remember, thanks guys, I remember talking to Miss Terry Columna, who's in heaven now. When she first started coming to the church, she'd asked me how the church was going, and I said, things are going well, praise the Lord. And she said, you'll know the strength of your church by how many people show up to pray. And I believe it's a true statement. Amen. The reason that Christianity and Christians are so dysfunctional in their activity is not because God is no longer powerful and not because the world's any stronger and not because sin's any more addictive. 
Sin's always been addictive. The world's always been what they are, dominated society. But God is immutable. God changes not. The activity that has been missing is a haste to pray. Amen. You know, I, I learned this lesson. I should say I'm learning this lesson, but the one... Last year when we lost the baby and the burdens were so great, the, the, the grief was so great, could not help but run to pray. Could not help it. And can I tell you, God delivered. God came through, praise his name. And I learned this lesson. I just don't view life the way God views life. God says that without him, I can do nothing. And I just don't believe that sometimes. And if I did, I would run to pray. If I viewed my sin the way he views his sin, the way he views my sin, how it is against his holiness and how it defies his person and his character, I would run to pray. If I knew the activity of my life and the implications that would come from it, man, if you're doing the Bible reading, you understand that you are not an island. The activity of your life will have implication on somebody somewhere sometime. If I understood the activity, the implication of my wrong choices and activity, if I understood the end result of them, and how they would affect my children and my future. I would run to pray. Amen. But can I tell you, you don't have to understand it all. You just have to believe God when God says, you should run to pray. You need me. Come boldly under the throne of grace to find grace and help in time of need. The altar of incense was set up. It represented the person of Christ. But right when he's given the instruction, the very first thing he said, you're going to burn incense on it. I wonder if where prayer is in the priority list of your activity. Is it a chore? Is it just a religious activity? Or is it your means of meeting with him and finding the ability through him to do all things? Do you run to pray? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that you would just do a work in our hearts and in our life, Lord, that we would understand not just that you would want us to be obedient, to pray, and to, to fulfill the, the role, the function, but you wait to meet us. You wait to commune with us and fellowship us. You wait for us. And how do we come? Do we stroll in our own arrogance and defiance of your authority? Are we absent, absent from the very activity? Or do we run? Do we run to pray? Lord, I pray that you'd help us, that we would be obedient to you. Lord, maybe there would be one or some here today that if they were honest, they've never been to the brazen altar. They've never had forgiveness of their sins and put their faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That today you would show them that they need to run to you in haste for salvation. Behold, today is the day of salvation. Lord, you told Moses to tell the children of Israel to eat in haste as they begin to go under the blood. That there would be some urgency about our spirituality. Lord, I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand again.